Hello and welcome to another module in the METFAST program. My name is Tom Peters from the University of Iowa. In this segment, I am going to discuss sampling strategies for airborne nanomaterials. By the end of this module, learners should be able to summarize the steps involved in assessing workplace exposures to nanomaterials, describe ways to anticipate and recognize hazards, identify important issues specific to sampling nanomaterials, and finally, select the right instrument and analytical methods to meet the sampling objective. We recommend using the exposure assessment strategy from the American Industrial Hygiene Association, or AIHA. In this strategy, you start with anticipation and recognition of potential workplace hazards in a basic characterization step. Various sampling methods are then used to evaluate exposures. The exposures are then determined to be acceptable, uncertain, or unacceptable. If acceptable, exposures can be reassessed periodically, for example quarterly, or after processes are changed. If uncertain, then further information should be gathered. This information would likely include more sampling. If unacceptable, controls should be put in place and then exposures reassessed. Then the process returns to the starting point forming a continuous loop with increasing confidence in understanding of workplace exposures. Why are we interested in sampling anyway? Well, there are a variety of reasons. One reason is to show compliance with an exposure limit, such as comparing carbon nanotube exposures to the NIOSH recommended exposure limit in a facility that synthesizes multi-wall carbon nanotubes or comparing titanium dioxide exposures to the NIOSH recommended exposure limit. Another reason is to identify and characterize hazard sources, such as determining areas with the highest likelihood of exposures to carbon nanotubes in a facility where multi-wall carbon nanotubes are used to strengthen sporting goods. Sampling can also be used to demonstrate the effectiveness of controls, such as comparing particle concentrations upstream and downstream of an air filter or with and without an exhaust hood in operation. Or it can be conducted to evaluate a research hypothesis such as to relate silver nanoparticle concentrations to worker lung health in an epidemiological study. Lastly, sampling is an important step in evaluating risk. Sampling can be used to determine exposure and or dose for a group of workers or to evaluate whether concentrations exceed levels defined to be immediately dangerous to life and health in emergency situations. Basic characterization is a crucial step in the design of an effective sampling strategy. Information is needed to characterize the workforce, including the number of workers, their job descriptions, and whether they use personal protective equipment. We also need to characterize the workplace, including the size, layout, and barriers that are in place in the facility, what processes are used to make products, and what ventilation is in place, which may include general, local, and or natural ventilation. We also need to follow the life cycle of the nanomaterial. What is the form of the nanomaterial when it is raw, handled, and or stepped through each of the processes in the workplace. Lastly, we also need to characterize other sources of particulate in the workplace, such as nanoparticles emitted from a propane forklift truck. A thorough knowledge of these sources help us to select the proper sampling equipment and then properly interpret results. Here are some examples from workplaces where nanomaterials are produced and handled. In the upper left, a nanomaterial handling operation is housed in a ventilated enclosure. In the lower left and upper middle photos, nanomaterials are harvested after production. In the lower middle and right photos, nanomaterials are being handled in raw form and after being mixed into other matrices. Before arriving at the facility, you should educate yourself. Study up on the processes that are used in the facility as part of anticipating potential hazards. 
There are numerous sources of reference material, including OSHA standards such as best practices and permissible exposure limits. NIOSH recommendations, including intelligence bulletins and recommended exposure limits. You can also find more up-to-date materials through a search of literature on such services as PubMed, Web of Knowledge, or Google Scholar, which happens to be my personal favorite. You should synthesize this information to identify the major hazards to look for during a facility walkthrough. An on-site walkthrough is a critical step in the anticipation and recognition process. A walkthrough allows you to observe and understand processes from raw materials through the finished product. Specific questions you should answer during a walkthrough are, is the process hot or cold, fast or slow, many or few? Where do the workers interact with the processes? What equipment is being used? Are there controls in place? Have there been any difficulties controlling contaminants? Ask plenty of questions of workers and managers. You are only there for a short time, but they can offer a wealth of data on how things change from day to day. Finally, you should review safety data sheets. During a walkthrough, you should use a checklist to keep track of all of the information you need to gather. On the next few slides, I show a portion of a walkthrough checklist that was specifically prepared for assessing nanomaterial exposures in a workplace. This checklist appears in the NIOSH document entitled Approaches to Safe Nanotechnology and is available at the link shown. On this slide are information that should be collected on processes and tasks in the workplace. As you go through the facility, you should check all of the processes used in the facility. For each process, you should describe the workplace, duration, frequency, number of workers involved, and whether PPE is used. For each nanomaterial, you should note its type, its processing rate, or volume used, and other characteristics, such as its primary particle size. A specific category is provided for controls, including a place to note the type of control, the dimensions, location, operating characteristics, and more specific information about the hood type, any airflow recirculation patterns, velocities that are measured. Also, there's information about filter type, manufacturer, resistance of the control device, the fan type that's in place, the flow rate through the system, and any stack position or design characteristics. Lastly, space is provided on the walkthrough checklist for visual observation, surface contamination, housekeeping, and physical layout. Safety data sheets should also be consulted as they provide important information on each of the raw materials used in the process. The critical information that should be taken from safety data sheets include chemical composition, which is found in Section 3 of the OSHA 2012 Safety Data Sheets, hazard identification, found in Section 2, exposure limits, and personal protective equipment recommendations, both found in Section 8, vapor pressure, if applicable, found in Section 9, and adverse health information, found in Section 11, toxicology, and in Section 15, regulations. We recommend a preliminary hazard assessment, or PHA, to provide a way to qualitatively synthesize the data that you collect during your research and walkthrough, the anticipation and recognition phase. When conducting a PHA, each hazard is ranked according to the severity of adverse health outcomes and the probability of the occurrence of exposures. There are many variations. I will show you one here, and I want to make the note that PHAs share many similarities to control banding. Here's an example of a preliminary hazard assessment data sheet. For each process, 
you described the process, the date the PHA was conducted, and why the analysis was performed. For example, an initial evaluation due to revision of a process or due to an added process. The hazard is described in the leftmost column, including the source, mechanism of contamination, and outcome, the adverse health effect. The next block of cells is used to rank the risk without the use of controls, including columns for severity, probability, and a risk code. Another block of cells is used to rank the risk with the use of controls. Severity is a way to express the magnitude of impact if a hazardous event occurs. It can be expressed in numerous ways. Here are several ways to express severity categorically, with category 1 being the most severe or catastrophic and category 4 being the least severe or negligible. Category 1, or a catastrophic classification, is assigned if the occurrence of a hazard results in, for example, a worker dying, a major monetary loss of equipment or product, extended downtime, or major environmental effects. Category 2 is assigned for severe injuries or illness, extensive monetary loss of equipment or product, and extended downtime, or environmental effects. Category 3 is assigned for less severe outcomes. And finally, Category 4 is assigned for negligible outcomes. Probabilities are assigned based on how frequently a hazardous event may occur. Again, various schemes may be used. I show one here that uses an alphabetic ranking where A is used for frequent that repeatedly occur in the workplace through F used for physically impossible to occur. On the right, I provide some process examples for the probability of inhaling nanomaterials. Frequent or probable inhalation is assigned to frequently performed processes, such as the handling of dry nanomaterials and maintenance or cleaning of equipment. A lower probability is assigned to processes less likely to occur, such as handling of nanomaterials in solution or interaction with nanomaterials if fully enclosed. Professional judgment is often used as a starting point, but measurements with direct reading instruments can be very helpful in assigning probabilities. Risk is assigned a ranking based on a combination of severity and probability. Here we see severity from catastrophic to negligible on the y-axis and probability from impossible or improbable to frequent on the x-axis. Under this system, processes with a risk rank of 3 are permissible, and those with a risk rank of 2 are acceptable for a limited time with management approval, and those with a risk rank of 1 are unacceptable and require some type of control to be put in place. We can see from this table that hazards with a catastrophic severity are only permissible if the probability is impossible or improbable. Those with negligible severity are permissible regardless of the probability of their occurrence. A review article published by Ding et al. 2017 in the Journal of Hazardous Materials provides a good source of information specifically on the release of engineered nanomaterials into the workplace. They compile research conducted to evaluate airborne concentrations resulting from many different activities, including synthesis, weighing, mixing, machining, cleaning, and maintenance. They give examples for a variety of different types of nanomaterials, such as metals and metal oxides, carbon nanotubes, and other nanomaterials. After the basic characterization, we are ready to make some measurements in the evaluation phase of the exposure assessment strategy. The first step is to group workers into similar exposure groups, or SEGs. Workers in a SEG have similar exposure profiles. For example, 
we can anticipate that the workers who synthesize multi-wall carbon nanotubes will have similar exposures, but that these exposures will be quite different from those workers who add multi-wall carbon nanotubes to strengthen epoxy or those who sand the epoxy with multi-wall carbon nanotubes embedded in them. This step is typically subjective and relies heavily on professional judgment. However, professional judgment is often based on visual cues, like a cloud of dust near a mechanical process. Such cues are good indicators of mass concentration, but often not for number or surface area concentration. Therefore, concentration mapping and task-based monitoring can be used to help properly identify SEGs. In concentration mapping, measurements are made with direct reading instruments throughout a facility. Here we show measurement locations with an X. This hypothetical facility has two processes with local exhaust ventilation leading to an air cleaner, which then discharges the cleaned air back into the facility. The concentration is measured at each location, noting the location with an X and Y coordinates and the concentration in a spreadsheet. These data are then used to generate a hazard map where red, for instance, indicates high concentration and white indicates low concentrations. Such maps can yield extremely useful information. In the example on the left, a red hotspot is observed at process two. The best course of action is to examine the controls and workplace practices in this area. Clearly, workers at the two processes would be grouped into different SEGs. In the middle example, hot spots are observed at the exhaust of the air cleaners, indicating that attention should be paid to evaluate the air cleaner. In the third example, at right, there are no clear hot spots and general exhaust ventilation should be considered to help lower concentrations throughout the facility. In example two and example three, mapping provides little evidence to group workers into different SEGs. Hazard mapping also provides a way to evaluate facility air quality over time. In this plot, we show the percentage of floor space relative to airborne concentration. Here we show the concentrations measured initially during a mapping exercise. 50% of the floor space was associated with concentrations higher than 0.5 milligrams per meter cubed, with a tail of concentrations that extends well above 2 milligrams per meter cubed. However, after controls were implemented, identified on the plot as post-control 1, the concentrations were much lower with 50% of the floor space associated with concentrations of 0.25 milligrams per meter cubed, with a tail extending to no greater than 0.75 milligrams per meter cubed. Similar concentrations were observed during hazard mapping three months later, identified as post-control two. So this gives us a way to show whether there are controls that are needed, and then do the controls that were implemented still work over time. Here I will show a published case study that demonstrates the importance of using different instruments to assess airborne exposures. Hazard mapping was performed at an engine machining and assembly center of International Truck and Engine Corporation in Indianapolis, Indiana. This facility consisted of roughly 1 million square feet, an area equivalent to 30 football fields under a single roof. The facility had poorly fitting, retrofitted enclosures and steam heat in a cam crank production area. New enclosures with gas heat were used in a blockhead rod line and an assembly area. In winter, we measured particle number concentrations with a condensation particle counter throughout the facility on four consecutive days at each location indicated with a cross. Number concentrations in blue are relatively low, approximately 50,000 to 100,000 particles per centimeter cubed. 
For reference, typical background concentrations in most homes or offices are approximately 10,000 particles per centimeter cubed. Concentrations in red are high, approximately 1 million particles per centimeter cubed. These hazard maps help us understand that there is low temporal variability in this facility from day to day. They also show that concentrations are highly variable between, but not within, specific areas of the plant. In the upper plots, we show number concentration measured in winter, which we just saw on the last slide, compared to mass concentrations taken at the same time. Despite high number concentrations in the blockhead rod area, mass concentrations were low, approximately 0.1 milligrams per meter cubed. In contrast, the highest mass concentrations were observed in the cam crank area. These plots show that mass concentration is a poor indicator of ultrafine particles. We returned to perform hazard mapping in the spring with results shown in the lower two plots. In this case, the mass concentrations remained similar, but the number concentrations in the blockhead rod line were dramatically lower. We ultimately identified that the high number concentrations were from direct fire gas burners, which were used to heat the air that was then recirculated with the effluent from the gas burners back into the facility. These data from hazard mapping helped us to confidently identify SEGs based on the physical divisions of the workplace. Hazard mapping as shown in the previous example can be extremely useful. However, one must consider its use in specific workplaces. In production facilities with regular and frequent work, materials handling and processing tasks. One can reasonably expect that concentrations will be temporarily stable. Facilities with stable concentrations are amenable to hazard mapping. However, those facilities with irregular and less predictable work schedules, like the research laboratory, have small batch processing that leads to high temporal variability in concentrations. Temporal variability introduces substantial uncertainty in hazard mapping, so it is sometimes better to focus on task-based monitoring. Here is an example of task-based monitoring. Direct reading instruments were used to monitor particle concentrations over time at a facility that produced nanomaterials used in batteries. As in hazard mapping, different instruments provide the ability to detect different particle types. Here I show number concentration from a condensation particle counter versus time in the top plot and mass concentration from a photometer versus time in the lower plot. Superimposed on the graphs are tasks, filling a hopper and changing a bag which is being filled with nanomaterials. The particle number concentrations were unrelated to tasks, presumably associated with something else going on within the facility. In this case, there was welding going on in another area that was within the building where these measurements were made. In contrast, mass concentrations were clearly associated with the tasks. Each time the hopper was filled or the hopper was filled and the bag was changed, we see a bump in respirable and total mass concentrations. These data helped us to define what types of measurements are important to collect in this facility. So here, the nanomaterial was not associated with ultrafine particles. Instead, the engineered nanomaterial was associated with particles in the larger size fractions, which are dominated by mass concentration. Further characterization of airborne particles is often warranted. Information for nanomaterials on safety data sheets is often incomplete or unintentionally misleading, and the information provided may not distinguish nano from bulk properties. We advise collecting samples for electron microscopy in areas where high concentrations are observed during hazard mapping. We call these areas hotspots. Or for tasks with high exposure potential, 
identified through task monitoring. As I will show in the next several slides, electron microscopy can help inform appropriate sampling strategies. There are several special collection devices for microscopy. Because filters often have complicated structure, making it difficult to identify particles apart from filter media. Instead, we need flat, featureless surfaces to maximize our ability to see particles with microscopy. One way to achieve this is by electrostatic precipitation. ESP Nano is a specific instrument available for this purpose. In this device, particles in an incoming airstream are electrically charged and then attracted to and deposit on an oppositely charged substrate suitable for electron microscopy. An alternative way to collect particles is to use a thermal precipitator. In a thermal precipitator, particles move from hot to cold in a thermal gradient. Particles can be deposited onto a substrate suitable for electron microscopy by placing the substrate on a cold surface in this thermal gradient. A commercial version of this device is available from RJ Lee Group. Through electron microscopy, you can determine important information regarding the nature of exposures. Here, for example, I depict the changes that occur to airborne particles released during different processing steps involving carbon nanotubes. At left, I show a carbon nanotube as delivered from a vendor. This particle may become airborne in operations such as handling or weighing of the carbon nanotubes. In contrast, a very different particle type becomes released when sanding a part composed of epoxy with CNTs added for strength. Here, the carbon nanotubes protrude from a larger epoxy core. From electron microscopy, one can also learn about the agglomerate state of nanomaterials. These images are taken from different areas of a wafer fabrication process called chemical mechanical planarization. The scale bar is 100 nanometers in all images. Images A through D show airborne particles collected in a wastewater treatment area. In most cases, the particles were highly agglomerated, like the amorphous silica shown in images A and B, and the mixed alumina silica agglomerate showing in image D. However, in some cases, much smaller agglomerates were observed, like that shown in image C. Similar particles were observed in other processes, such as the agglomerate of amorphous silica shown in image E from the subfabrication task area and the agglomerate of alumina from the clean room task area shown in image F. It is also important to collect information about background and incidental particles that may be present in the workplace. We need to make sure that we can distinguish sources of engineered nanomaterials apart from these particles. Sources of nanoparticles include combustion and other high temperature sources such as exhaust from propane or diesel engines or heating units, like we saw in the case study presented earlier in this lesson. One way to accomplish this task is to measure workplace concentrations with direct reading instruments with and without nanomaterial operations in place. Another way is to use electron microscopy. Here I show images of particles collected in a facility that produces lithium titanate metal oxide powder for use in rechargeable batteries. At left, we were able to identify three different particle types through their morphologies using transmission electron microscopy. At right, we identified that the nanomaterial were the large spherical particles, whereas incidental particles were chain agglomerates attributed to welding fume. For nanomaterials with an exposure limit, sampling methods are provided in guidance documents. In the NIOSH Current Intelligence Bulletin, CIB, on titanium dioxide, respirable sampling is called for with collection of two samples, one analyzed by ICPMS 
to determine bulk titanium content, and the other analyzed by electron microscopy to apportion the titanium mass determined by inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry into ultrafine and fine fractions. There are separate mass base exposure limits for ultrafine and fine particles, which these measurements can then be compared to. Two respirable samples are also called for in the current intelligence bulletin from NIOSH on carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. In this case, one sample is analyzed for elemental carbon, which is compared to a mass base limit. The other sample is analyzed by electron microscopy to identify free carbon nanotubes. A more common situation is the need to assess exposures for nanomaterials without exposure limits or other guidance documents. There is no single metric agreed upon for nanomaterials. Different metrics may best represent different sources. A leak from a synthesis reactor would probably be best represented by number concentration to avoid confusion from larger background particles, whereas handling powders results in large greater than one micrometer agglomerates that are well represented with mass concentration. For this reason, we recommend a multi-metric approach like that shown in concentration mapping and task-based monitoring earlier. The source of an aerosol defines its size and concentration, where concentration is expressed by different metrics. The metrics used for aerosol quantity are number, surface area, and mass concentration by particle size. Hot sources create vapors that nucleate or condense to form particles typically smaller than one micrometer, known as nano, ultrafine, and fine particles. A source of nanoparticles, for instance, might be a leak from a synthesis reactor. In contrast, mechanical sources break up a bulk material into coarse particles that are primarily larger than one micrometer, such as grinding or sanding. Mass concentration is typically used as an exposure metric, but other metrics, such as number or surface area concentration, may be more representative of exposures and or indicative of adverse health effects. If there are multiple modes of particles present in the workplace, which is common, particle number, surface area, and mass concentration are often not well correlated. This table shows some portable direct reading instruments that can be used to assess exposures by different metrics. The photometer provides a direct readout of mass concentration integrated over many sizes, from approximately 100 nanometers to 10 micrometers over a wide concentration range up to 150 milligrams per meter cubed. In reality, the efficiency of light scattering drops off dramatically for particles smaller than about 300 nanometers. So the effective lower limit for these light scattering devices is about 300 nanometers, rather than 100 nanometers listed in this table. Photometers have been used by industrial hygienists for decades. Many models can be worn on the belt with sampling tube placed in the worker's breathing zone. Condensation particle counters provide a direct measure of particle number concentration from about 10 nanometers to 1 micrometers. The concentration range varies by instrument, but the upper limit is approximately 100,000 particles per centimeter cubed, and dilution is needed for higher concentrations. Ultrafine particles are grown by condensation to where they can be counted by light scattering. These instruments are becoming more commonplace in industrial hygiene as they provide measurement of ultrafine particles. The optical particle counter yields a size distribution by number from approximately 300 nanometers to about 5 micrometers in different numbers of size bins. Typically, lower cost units have six size bins. The concentration range is much lower than for the CPC, but is still useful because this device cannot see nanoparticles that have the highest number concentrations. Lastly, diffusion chargers provide a direct output of surface area concentration of submicrometer particles 
These instruments are uncommon in today's industrial hygiene practice. Like NIOSH, we emphasize the use of instruments that provide the ability to see particles across a wide range of multiple metrics. The condensation particle counter provides the ability to see ultrafine particles which dominate number concentrations. For larger particles, a photometer is a simple way to account for fine and coarse particles that dominate mass concentrations. Alternatively, an optical particle counter can be used to assess the number concentration by size of particles larger than 300 nanometers. If used, make sure that the optical particle counter you select provides output in mass concentrations as well as raw number concentrations. This slide shows specific direct reading instruments that are used by the NIOSH nanomaterial field team including a condensation particle counter to measure sub-micrometer particle number concentrations and an optical particle counter that can be used to measure larger particles, in this case mass concentration in four size ranges, 1 micrometer, 2.5 micrometer, 4.0 micrometers, and 10 micrometers. This device is nice because it also offers an after filter so that the optical information can be back corrected to particle mass concentration, a real measure of particle mass concentration. NIOSH has put forth two versions of assessing exposures in the nanotechnology workplace that they call NEAT techniques. In 2010, they introduced NEAT 1.0 which stood for Nanoparticle Emission Assessment Technique. Notice that I highlighted the word particle in emission. The goal of NEAT 1.0 was to identify and measure the release of engineered nanoparticles into the work environment. They called for a CPC, a condensation particle counter, and an OPC, an optical particle counter, to directly measure ultrafine, fine, and coarse particles by number and mass. They also called for filter-based air sampling and subsequent chemical and microscopic analysis to identify particle types. In 2016, they replaced version 1 with NEAT 2.0 with a change in the acronym NEAT to Nanomaterial Exposure Assessment Technique. Importantly, Version 2 broadened the emphasis from just engineered nanoparticles, those particles that are sub 100 nanometers in size, to engineered nanomaterials, which may occur in any size range. Also, the target of assessment was shifted from processes to worker exposures. NEAT 2.0 expands upon NEAT 1.0 adding quantitative and qualitative assessment of exposures expressed as personal breathing zone concentrations, or PBZ concentrations. NEAT 2.0 requires measurements made in the personal breathing zone, in the work area, and in a background location. Personal breathing zone measurements provide a true indicator of worker exposure integrated throughout a day that can be compared to an occupational exposure limit if it's available. Area samples are used to survey suspected emission sources and to evaluate engineering controls. Background samples are used to evaluate the contribution of non-process emission sources, such as propane forklift trucks, which are known emitters of ultrafine particles. The types of sampling include collection of particulate onto filters or data logging with direct reading instruments. Filter cassettes are used to sample particles in the personal breathing zone, in the work area, and background locations over full shifts or during specific tasks. Given the size of portable DRIs, measurements are limited to area and background locations. This picture shows DRIs being used in an area to measure concentrations. The filter media used during sampling 
and the methods used to analyze collected particles differ based on purpose. For electron microscopy, mixed cellulose ester filters can be analyzed following NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods, the acronym of which is NMAMP, and the method is 7402, Analysis by Transmission Electron Microscopy. In contrast, polycarbonate filters can be used to provide a flat, featureless surface needed for scanning electron microscopy. Electron microscopy is typically expensive, however, ranging from $200 to $500 per sample. Bulk analysis is often considerably less expensive. Here are a few examples of bulk analysis. Quartz fiber filters are analyzed by NMAM method 5040 to determine elemental carbon content when sampling for carbon nanotubes. And mixed cellulose ester filters are analyzed by NMAM 7300 to determine elements by ICP for a variety of metal containing nanomaterials. There are reasons to sample all or fractions of airborne particles. Total dust or open face cassettes collect all particles without intentionally separating out any size fraction, which may be helpful in characterizing emission sources in area sampling. Size selective samplers are used to assess personal breathing zone exposures. Inhalable samplers collect only those particles that can aspirate into the human body and are most useful in assessing adverse health effects of the upper airways. Respirable samplers collect only those particles that can reach the alveolar region, which is important when assessing adverse health effects that occur deep in the lung. Respirable sampling is called for in the NIOSH recommended exposure limits for titanium dioxide and carbon nanotubes and nanofibers. Finally, NIOSH recommends wipe sampling to evaluate surface contamination. Although these measures are generally not correlated well with worker inhalation exposures, they provide a way to assess hygiene and potential dermal exposure. There are qualitative or quantitative methods, including the following. Generally, gauze, filter paper, or pre-moistened wipes are used to sample a predetermined area as shown in the photo. These samples are typically analyzed by inductively coupled plasma methods, such as NMAM method 9100 for measuring lead in surface wipes, or NMAM method 9102 for measuring elements on wipes. The question is how clean is clean enough? And there is some guidance that Brookhaven National Laboratory has provided. And I give this website address and they give surface wipe criteria for several different elements. Now I will introduce three case studies that exemplify the use of the AIHA exposure assessment strategy. These case studies were adapted from a professional development course delivered by NIOSH. They are fictitional, but based on experience gained by the NIOSH nanotechnology field team over many years. In the first case study, we evaluate exposures in the synthesis of multi-wall carbon nanotubes. Upon a walkthrough of the facility, we determine that the operations of concern are a screw thread machine using nitric acid to purify carbon nanotubes and packaging the CNTs into buckets for shipping. We follow sampling procedures for carbon nanotubes outlined in the NIOSH Current Intelligence Bulletin, taking one respirable sample for the measurement of elemental carbon and a second for microscopy to determine if free carbon nanotubes are present. We also follow NMAM 7907 to sample for nitric acid. Following NEAT version 2.0, we also measure particle number concentrations by CPC, area samples, and background samples. Let's look at the results. For the screw thread operation, personal breathing zone concentrations exceeded 
recommended exposure limits for both carbon nanotubes and nitric acid. Area concentrations were lower, but still over the recommended exposure limit for CNTs. Free CNTs were identified by microscopy in both samples, and particle number concentrations were elevated above background. Based on these findings, we recommend local exhaust ventilation as the screw thread operation is fixed in position with clear inlets and outlets. Concentrations observed with filter sampling were low in the packing area. However, the finding that CNTs were observed by microscopy suggests that controls should be put in place. In this case, the bucket packing operation could be performed in a glove box, for example. Remember to start the exposure assessment process again after controls are put in place. In the next case, multi-wall carbon nanotubes are blended into epoxy as a strengthener. In the walkthrough, two locations of high exposure potential were identified, pouring multi-wall carbon nanotubes into an extruder and surface grinding the epoxy after hardening. Again, we are concerned with carbon nanotube exposures for which there is a recommended exposure limit based on duplicate respirable filter sampling. We also measure number concentrations with a condensation particle counter. Let's look at the results. For the pouring operation, elemental carbon concentrations were well above the recommended exposure limit, and free CNTs were visually observed by transmission electron microscopy. Also, number concentrations were elevated above background. So clearly, we need to put controls in place Again, favoring local exhaust ventilation for this fixed extruder operation. For surface grinding, elemental carbon was elevated above the REL, but there were no free carbon nanotubes observed by microscopy. Grinding introduces mechanical energy that breaks up the epoxy into large particles with carbon nanotubes embedded in the matrix, which explains how the elemental carbon can be observed in filter samples, but not observed by electron microscopy. This result demonstrates the importance of collecting and analyzing a second sample by TEM and not just relying on analysis of elemental carbon by method 5040 when measuring for carbon nanotubes. These results place us in an uncertain situation because more information should be collected on the morphology of the epoxy particles after grinding. Little is known on the toxicity of carbon nanotubes protruding from the surface of an epoxy particle, for example. An interim strategy would be to maintain concentrations as low as reasonably achievable by using grinding hoods to lower exposures. Finally, the exposure assessment should be restarted after implementing controls and collecting more data. In this case study, a 3D printer using a powder bed fusion process, a hot process, is used to manufacture metal hip joints. The operator programs the 3D print job, sets up the feed lines with three sealed containers of different metals, nanoscale titanium, aluminum, and cobalt, and then starts the process. Once complete, the operator removes the hip joint and wipes down the chamber. The main concern is fume inhalation exposure to the various metals used in the process. The fume may contain titanium dioxide for which there are recommended exposure limits depending on the size of the fume, ultrafine or fine. Thus, following the current intelligence bulletin for titanium dioxide, we use the respirable samples in duplicate, one to measure titanium concentration and a second for electron microscopy. There are also recommended exposure limits for airborne aluminum and cobalt. Respirable sampling is used for aluminum because it is associated with lower respiratory health effects, whereas inhalable sampling is used for cobalt as it may affect the upper airways. Skin absorption is also a concern for cobalt Thus, surface wipes are appropriate at all task locations, and nitrile gloves should be worn when cleaning the chamber. From the results, 
we can see titanium concentrations were well above background, above the REL for ultrafine particles, but lower than that for fine titanium dioxide. The microscopy indicates that nanomaterial was present in the personal breathing zone sample. However, we need more extensive particle size distribution analysis to attribute the measured titanium concentration to fine or ultrafine particles. Concentrations in the personal breathing zone samples were higher than area samples, which suggests that specific tasks cause higher exposures. Further task-based monitoring with direct reading instruments is recommended to identify those tasks. For aluminum, personal breathing zone concentrations were near the recommended exposure limit, which requires further monitoring and may ultimately require local exhaust ventilation. For cobalt, personal breathing zone concentrations were over the recommended exposure limit. Taken together, a system to ventilate the printer chamber should be implemented to clear any fume before the chamber is open. Then, once again, after controls are in place, the exposure assessment should be conducted again. Here I list specific resources that are very useful for conducting nanomaterial exposure assessments. The first one is building a safety program to protect nanotechnology workforce, a guide for small to medium-sized enterprises. The second one is approaches to safe nanotechnology, managing health and safety concerns associated with engineered nanomaterials. In this module, we described how to apply the exposure assessment strategy from AIHA to assess exposures to engineered nanomaterials. We used anticipation and recognition to define a sampling objective, what to measure, how to measure it, and how to interpret results before sampling. We selected the right instruments and analytical methods to meet the sampling objective and finally, we learned from case studies how to interpret results. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of National Institutes of Health.